Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Melissa. I am the president of the Neshoba Valley Chamber of Commerce. Again, thank you for joining us today. Personally, I've not yet done my homework on ranked choice voting, so I am looking forward to hearing from our two great speakers on this issue and looking forward to being able to make a more informed decision at the ballots. I'm going to turn it over to Matt Keswick of Keswick Consulting, and Matt is going to introduce our speakers, I think, and say a few words. Um, thanks, Melissa. As uh, most of you know, the last uh, several years uh, for all of our ballot initiatives um, up and down the ballot for uh, Massachusetts, uh, we usually do forums, not really debates, just basically throwing out uh, both sides of the issue and let you make a decision for yourself. Um, we chatted a couple weeks ago, or actually a month or so ago, about the right to repair issue uh, in Massachusetts. That's question one and question two. There's only two ballot questions this year. It was on ranked choice vote, voting, which is something uh, new and different for Massachusetts voters. So we're going to hear about that a little bit from our speakers. The kind of quick updates on Beacon Hill are um, there's a interim budget through Halloween, so through October 31st. So the next couple of weeks, you'll see the budget process uh, heating up as the governor, the center president, the speaker get together, come up with some revenue numbers, and basically pass a budget, which will go for the remainder of the year, November through June 30th. And then we fall off a cliff after that. So stay tuned on that one. Remember, the legislature extended their session from July 31st to December 31st. So they're actually in for the rest of the year. Um, and uh, we'll continue to monitor schools and see what happens with that. Looks like we've gotten a little bit of bad news from uh, districts around the state, from Falmouth to Pittsfield and everywhere in between. So we'll, uh, we'll see what happens with that. But um, as always, with any questions on public policy, on any issues up at the state house, um, feel free to ask, send them through Melissa, and I will try to get a prompt response to you on any questions you may have relative to uh, the legislature or to public policy. Thank you. That, Melissa, get back to you. Thank you, Matt. And Matt has been a great resource for our, for our businesses, especially during this pandemic. Um, I would like to thank Matt Wachusa Community College for sponsoring our public policy series for another season. And I'm going to introduce Leanne Scales. And Leanne, can you talk, tell us a little bit about the college, what's been happening, and, maybe, and introduce your peers today? Thank you, Melissa. Um, everything's going great at the college for the fall semester. I continue to be so impressed and inspired by our faculty and students. Last spring, they shifted to a remote form of learning. Um, we are now hybrid, so mostly remote, about 15% in person for things like labs and art classes and developmental ed. But everyone has taken on this new phase and new way of living and learning, and I couldn't be more proud. Um, we are delighted to sponsor this series. We have for years, and it's because Mount Wachusett Community College believes our students have to not only be prepared academically and be prepared to go into careers, but we want them to be engaged and informed citizens too, which is why we are home to the Brewer Center named for our very own Senator Brewer, who's on the call with me today. And he is a former rep, Senator, Chair of Ways and Means, and was just a real source of strength for so many constituencies when he served the Commonwealth. And in the spirit of him getting that bug of service when he was in college, we are home to the Brewer Center that hosts dialogues, has been all summer, all fall, and they've all been um, very deftly moderated by Dr. Shelley Arrington Nicholson, who's also on the phone. And she has hosted a series of dialogues on everything our students need to know to be prepared for this election and for their life. Um, we had a rousing discussion about the Supreme Court last week that I will never forget. And the students asked such smart, good questions. And I feel that the future is in pretty good hands. I'm also joined by Rachel Fricardé. She leads our workforce development and lifelong learning um, division, really important. So she oversees not just folks who are coming back to retrain and find new careers. She does very important work um, in partnership with our sheriff and with the state to educate prisoners so that we work on our recidivism rate. She manages all of our non-credit offerings. So you wanna know how to knit, you wanna know how to maybe get a Google IT certificate. She's the place to go. And she works with a great um, innovative team who are thinking about education in new ways every day. That's who's with me today. I am thrilled to be learning more about this important initiative. And I really applaud um, your, your chamber, Melissa, for taking on these important issues and sharing them. So our first speaker today is Jen Nasser, and she is the pro-range choice voting. That's what she's gonna to talk to us this morning about. 
She is an attorney and political advisor living in Boston's Back Bay neighborhood. She campaigned to represent District 8 and the Boston City Council in 2019, advancing through a preliminary election to the runoff election in November. Um, I am actually, Jen has a quite the lengthy um, um, resume. I'm going to post it in our chat. Um, and Jen, I'm just going to turn it over to you. And if you want to say a few words um, about, you know, all the amazing things that you've done. Um, we've had, we've done some things together, I think, in the past. And, um, and then just jump right into your um, sharing with us your thoughts. Great. Well, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Matt, um, for inviting me. I'm excited to be part of this. So, um, you know, I, I was the, I've had a very long history in politics and government um, dating back. I grew up in New York and I was in the Nassau County Legislature in New York State Senate, moved to Massachusetts, and I've been between Governor Swift's office, running statewide campaigns, um, doing fundraising. And um, I actually was the chair of the Massachusetts Republican Party. Um, and so since then I have been doing TV and radio political commentary as a Republican strategist. And I run an organization dedicated to energizing and educating women to run for office. Um, which is kind of what brought me to being um, supportive of ranked choice voting, because in what I do, I know this what the statistics are. And so at one, as a Republican in Massachusetts, um, I ran a race myself that was supposed to be a nonpartisan race. Um, my opponent and her um, and her colleagues made it very, very partisan. And so I think ranked choice voting would have helped in that situation. I had seen as chair of the Massachusetts Republican Party while Charlie Baker was running his first race, how ranked choice voting would have come into play. At that same time, um, right after Richard Tissay running against um, John Tierney, ranked choice voting would have helped in that situation. My dear friend, Beth Lindstrom, who's on this call right now, if we had ranked choice voting in that primary, Beth would have 100% have been the Republican nominee. And so, um, you know, so I go on on my political end, but then also as a woman, the numbers are horrific around the country for women being elected to office. We're still under one quarter represented, whereas women make up over half of the population. And so my view is if we had ranked choice voting, most people who go into vote would maybe they would say, oh, well, I know the man and the man has been the incumbent. But if not him, this woman is a really good choice. And maybe that's another way to boost up our numbers. But we need to do something because in our history, in 2020, regardless of what the Democrats say, what the Republicans say, women still only make up somewhere between 20 and 25% of our state legislatures, and we're still under 25% in Congress. So thank you very much for having me, and that is, uh, that's is—that's all I have to say for now. All right, Bruce, now I, sorry, I have to pull up my notes. Um, so Congressman Bruce, it, um, Bruce, I didn't practice your last name. Halquin. Halquin, that was easy. Um, Bruce is an American businessman and politician. Republican, he represented Maine's second congressional district in the U.S. House of Representatives from 2015 to 2019. And he was first elected to Congress in 2014 general election. From 2010 to 2012, he was the Maine state treasurer. And also he has a much longer um, resume that I'm going to post in the chat for everybody. And I'm without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over, Bruce. Thank you, Melissa, very much. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> first of all, and Matt, thank you for setting this up. I appreciate it. And Jen, uh, thank you. And I salute you for the great work that you're doing with respect to uh, getting women in, uh, in elective office. So we certainly need a lot more of them. Good for you to do that. Um, my remarks, um, folks, are, are based not on theory, but on real time use of ranked voting up here in Maine. Uh, and I'm taking the other side of the, the, the equation from Jen and I think you'll see why. And first of all, when it comes to using a ranked voting to get more women in politics, I hope my remarks will be gender neutral because it's not designed to, uh, to do that. First of all, 
up here in Maine, I mean, you folks used to own us until 1820, right? So, you know, we love the folks in Massachusetts. You're our friends. You own a lot of our real estate up here and you help fuel our economy. So thank you all for that. For uh, over 200 years up here, we've always uh, gone to the polls and it's one person, one vote. The individual who gets the most votes on election day wins. It's really simple. It's, it's not political at all. Folks like, um, uh, like Ed Muskie, a Democrat, was elected this way, and Margaret Chase Smith, a Republican, was elected this way, and I was elected on and on and on. So it, it, changing the way we vote, one person, one vote in Maine, is not a Maine idea. That's the point I'm trying to make, Melissa. This is a process that was brought to Maine by outside political activists, uh, they eventually, and it took them about three years, convinced a small minority of voters in a referendum, a special election, uh, to push this over the top. And it was really Portland area activists that pushed this over the top. The second district in Maine, there are only two districts in Maine. The first district uh, is, is the politics are very different, more like Boston. And it extends a little sliver along the coast from Camden to Kittery, goes in about 20 miles. Shelly Pingree runs that or, or represents that district. I represented about 88% of the landmass in Maine, the rural part of the state, the real Maine, Western Maine, Central Maine, Northern Maine, down East Maine. And during those, that referendum process when ranked voting was finally passed in the state, the second district of Maine rejected it twice. So it was the Portland area, a small group of people that pushed it over the top. Uh, and in the end, about 15% of registered voters uh, imposed this on, on the state. Now they did it with out of state money uh, from um, Soros and a fellow by the name of John Arnold down in Houston, used to be an Enron guy. And there's an organization called Fair Vote, which is a great misnomer. Fair Vote uh, of Maryland, who's been the national organization that's pushing this in about a dozen different states, including, uh, I'm guessing, in Massachusetts. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about what we were promised, because I'm guessing, Matt, you folks are being promised the same thing and how it just didn't work. First of all, the folks came to Maine, spent a ton of money in a loose referendum process we have here in, Maine, in a really cheap media market. Remember, when you go on TV and radio in Maine, you don't need to touch the Boston market at all. So folks come up here, we're very accepting, we're very welcoming, small population, cheap media market, loose referendum process, and we're like the guinea pigs, we're the lab rats. They experiment up here. And this is one of the experiments they were able to pass up here. And we've been battling to repeal it ever since. Okay, one of the things they promised. If you adopt rank voting, <clears throat> you'll get money out of politics. Well, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Um, my race in 2018, my second re-election, which by the way, I won on election day. I received 2,200 more votes than my three opponents, uh, all very liberal, one a Democrat and two uh, independents. Uh, I beat them all, but nine days later, the seat was awarded to the guy that came in second. But we were promised um, money would get out of political campaigns if you use RCV. There were, at the time, $24 million spent on a congressional district race in the state of Maine with a cheap media market. At the time, I think it was a national average. I think the average congressional race matt around the country is about 3 million bucks, 24 million, it was horrible, was spent up here in 2018. So again, this is not theory, it's reality. And what drives money in politics is whether or not the race is a swing district that could cause the balance of power to shift in Washington. It has nothing to do with ranked choice voting. Look at Susan Collins' race. That is under ranked choice voting. There will be when it's all, when everyone's in, their campaigns, the outside groups, about $100 million will be spent on that Senate race. So ranked voting has nothing to do with getting money in or out of congressional races. Second of all, we were promised by the fair vote folks pushing ranked voting that these campaigns would become more civil. Well, that's absurd. Um, the Susan Collins, Sarah Gideon race that's going on right now in Maine is ranked nationally as the number one nastiest race in the country. And it is, believe me, we're listening to the ads up here. <clears throat> My race 
in 2018 was horrific. It led the nation. It was one of the top five races in the country and probably the nastiest. So again, what's going to cause a race to be contentious or not has nothing to do with ranked voting. Nothing, zero. It depends on does that race have the opportunity to change the balance of power in the House of Representatives in Washington or the United States Senate. Third thing we were promised, and they're probably promising you folks too, <clears throat> is that the ultimate winner, the individual who doesn't necessarily win on election day, doesn't get the most votes on election day, but eventually is awarded the seat under ranked voting, will receive at least 50% of the votes. It's a complete lie. It's just not true. And the reason for that is under ranked voting, it is so confusing that there is a high number, an unusually high number of votes that are tossed out. In my congressional race, there are about 8,000 votes that were tossed out the window because they were mismarked and so forth and so on. It's so confusing. Therefore, the ultimate winner of the race never received more than 50% of the vote. Now, in a traditionally conducted election, one person gets one vote instead of going to the ballot box and having a ballot where you can mul vote multiple times. Some of the votes are counted sometimes, sometimes they're not. In a standard election, one person, one vote, roughly historically in Maine, roughly one to 2,000 votes are thrown out. Here, there were 8,000 thrown out. So the ultimate fella that was awarded the seat, even though we lost an election day, um, never received more than 50% of the vote. Here's a real heads up for you. And um, getting to the end of my remarks, uh, Melissa, such that we can leave plenty of time for Q&A. <clears throat> we did a poll when the dust settled after the election. This should scare the daylights out of everybody in Massachusetts. We did a poll among Republicans who decided not to vote on election day. The number one reason they decided not to vote, 26% was because of confusion of ranked choice voting. I travel the state all the time um, when able to, uh, not, not as much recently, and speak to various groups about all kinds of different issues. I'm still very involved up here. I'll never forget this as long as I live. This is maybe about a year ago. There was a group over in Oxford County and we were talking about free markets versus uh, socialized economies. And a woman stood up during the Q&A. She was, I'm 66. She was you know, about my age, she was in tears. She said, Bruce, my mother, who's in her 80s, has never missed an election ever in her lifetime. In 2018, she was so confused that she stayed home. She was in tears. She had never missed an election in her lifetime, in her 80s, in good health. She just gave up. So remember, ranked voting is a system designed by, created and designed by political activists to harvest second place votes to win, God bless, to win close elections. It has nothing to do with normal folks, average folks, go to the polls, one person, one vote, you get the most votes, it's over. We've been doing that for 200 years here. Rank voting was designed by political activists. And to be very honest with you, not to be partisan, just to tell you the truth, is that liberal political activists who brought this to Maine and were pushing this across the country are really well trained to do this. And as a result, they harvest these extra votes and try to win close elections. Now, another interesting thing, parenthetically up here, <clears throat> really interesting, is that the main constitution, and you should check, Matt, about the Massachusetts constitution, the main state constitution does not allow the use of rank choice voting to select our candidates for state office. You can't select the governor. You can't select 186 members of the a state legislature, the Senate and the House, can't select them using ranked voting. You can do it in the primary, but in the general election, you can't use it. It's against the law up here. This was, however, the, um, the 18 inches of daylight that the political activists, the fair vote people use. They said, well, wait a minute. It's silent on federal races. 
So my race in 2018 for the United States Congress was the first and only federal race so, to, so far, the first and only federal race in the country to, be, uh, to go under the gun uh, of, of ranked uh, of rank choice voting. Um, there was a law recently passed up here last year by the governor in the legislature to expand ranked voting to be used in the presidential election in 30 days. And it looks like that's gonna happen too. So <clears throat> that's the skinny. Um, I could talk a little bit more about this. Uh, Melissa, unless you wanna open it up to Q and A, it's 824, your call. But, um, Jen, you were gonna say something? Yeah, can I just go back? So, I mean, I gave an introduction as to why I am a supporter of ranked choice voting, but I'm also on the National Board of Fair Vote. And the reason that I ended up getting on it was for exactly the same reasons that I've seen that our traditional system does not benefit the people who really need, when we need to level the playing field, we need to, and, and I'm sorry, you know, Bruce, that you, were, you weren't reelected in 2018, but you know, when you look at what democracy is, I look at it as being bipartisan, having both parties in office, and I look at it between having both men and women in office. And so maybe I'm skewed more on the women end because I'm really looking to boost up those numbers right now. But the National Board of Fair Vote, I kind of a little bit take offense to it being political activists because the people that I'm on the board with are actually policy wonks. They're people who have been researching democracy and better ways to improve democracy for 20 years. And they are dedicated to that. They're not activists. They're not running around. They're not doing the grassroots stuff. I don't even know if they would know how to run a campaign if they had to. Um, I'm probably the most political person on our in our meetings. Um, the way I look at it is you never get to waste your vote with ranked choice voting. So I'll use my my race as an as a perfect example for Boston City Council. I got through a preliminary. I'm one of two candidates. One is a Democratic activist and me Republican activist. And so if people had the opportunity to go and say one or two, Maybe I would have been everyone's too, but maybe she would have been not the first for other people. And so it could have it could have turned on its head and I could have won. In Richard Tissé's race back in 2012, Dan Fishman was the candidate that was the spoiler candidate. He got four points off of that election. Tissé and Tierney were one point away from each other. Those votes could have been Richard Tissé's votes. And so I, even though I understand how it turns elections on its head, it also gives other people who would have never been able to have achieved elective office an opportunity. And so, um, you know, it ensures that majority rules because at some point you do have to get to 50%. It is a simple way to vote because all you need to do is tell people it's either one or two. It's like right now going through the, the choice of doing an absentee ballot, universal ballot. How do, how do people fill in their ballots? Everyone learns at some point. It's a learning process. Um, you know, and this it gives the power to people, to people being able to um, to rank their votes and to say, maybe I like this person, but if my first doesn't come in, then the second person is the other person that I like. So, I mean, those are those are reasons for me why I think this is a great ballot question. Yeah, I wanted to uh, just address the uh, point that uh, Bruce made um, on the constitutional uh, issue. Um, I have heard chirping that. Um, somebody may file an amicus brief with um, the Mass SJC Supreme Judicial Court regarding that one vote piece. Was that ever addressed before the um, election in Maine or was it only addressed after the election? Matt, ask the question one more time. I didn't understand it. Um, on the one vote piece, you alluded to that the Maine constitution, it's invalid, even though it exists. I think the similar thought is here in Massachusetts, that same issue contends that the constitutions must be in parallel. So there may be somebody filing an amicus brief. I was curious if any of that work had been done prior to the election or only after the election results. No, prior to the election, the uh, <clears throat> this is back, you, you can Google this and find this pretty easily, Matt. Back, it must have been 2016, 2017, uh, the main state Supreme Court 
uh, ruled specifically that rank voting is illegal to be used in the state uh, for to elect state candidates, silent on federal, but state candidates, because the main constitution says a plurality of the votes cast goes to the person who wins. Common sense, right? So that was done before. Okay. And um, same question for Jen. Um, do you know what um, legal research was done on behalf of the um, constitution? I know it went through the attorney general for approval to get on the ballot, but were there any challenges either through the secretary of state's office or through the attorney general's office, those hurdles you have to get on to actually get on the ballot? Was that issue ever raised about um, one vote, one person? No, no, no challenges. The Massachusetts Constitution does not say that we need a plurality. Okay, interesting. Bruce, just one other uh, question um, while we kind of get the uh, the floor open here. Just curious of the political candidate and similar to Jen, um, you both run for office um, with and without this. How does it affect getting votes in a campaign? Like, does it change your strategy, the way you campaign? how you campaign, where you campaign. Um, are you sending out two messages to two different crowds? I'm just curious that from kind of a political science perspective. No, it's a really good question. And Jen, uh, I want to apologize if I sounded like I was um, uh, attacking you. I was not. My, um, my contact with Fair Vote up here has just been through the people they hired to be on the ground, which are uh, who were and who are political activists. So that's my, that's my, my reference point. Um, now, and don't worry about me losing. My God, I'm a business guy. I got a full life. I'm still very involved. There are elections every two years. I'm good to go. Everything's fine. But thank you for that, those kind words. Um, but I do want to say in, in, in going down the list that you're, the question you're talking about, Matt, again, this is not theory up here. Uh, the only federal race used in the country with ranked voting, um, the ultimate winner, the Democrat, did not receive 50% of the vote. It's just a fact. So now let's go answer your question, Matt. Okay, <clears throat> um, I'll talk about my race and I'll talk about Susan Collins' race. And this will be, I think, very illustrative for your group. In my race, um, I'm a Republican. Um, at the time, the only um, Republican in New England in the US House of Representatives. There are now none. Uh, there's a Democrat who was eventually awarded the seat very, quite far left. I'm, I know we're not supposed to talk politics, most of I'm not, I'm just trying to be descriptive. Very, very far left. And then there were two independent candidates. There were also one issue candidates, very, very far left. One individual, um, and it's really easy to get on the ballot up here. One individual was a Portland attorney who didn't even live in the district. The second individual, was a, a nice enough fellow who lived on a little island out in Maine. They publicly, and again, this is not me, you can Google this. During the debates and other times, they publicly said, we're not going to win. We have no intention of winning. We have no staff. We have no funding. We are on the ballot just to make sure the people that we bring to the voting process make sure they vote for the Democrat second. So again, these are single issue people that came into the election with the sole purpose of directing second place votes to the individual who lost on election day, but was eventually awarded the seat. Now let's talk about Susan Collins race. Collins is a Republican, the only Republican Senator in New England uh, still. Sarah Gideon is the Democrat, again, very, very far left. And then there are two other independent candidates. One whose name is Lisa Savage. Uh, she is a protester, uh, awfully nice uh, lady. Is that on her resume? Uh, yeah, I mean, she protests outside BIW and has for years. So she's a protester, but she's very well, uh, you know, she speaks well and she conducts herself well. She is, well, in any event. And, and then there's another fellow by the name of Max Lynn, who also embraces very um, liberal issues. Now, neither of them are going to win. They have no campaigns. They have very little funding. Max put in a little bit of his own money. And if you drive around Maine and you look at the yard signs, on Lisa Savage's yard sign, 
it says, it says on the yard sign, vote Lisa number one, vote Lisa first. And in her debate, she makes it very clear. Hey, look, Rick, voting's in play here. Meaning, vote for me first if you're a protester, you don't like BIW, you don't like the Department of Defense, but make sure you vote for the Democrat second. So what has happened, Matt, from a political science standpoint is rank voting has created a, a, a paradigm where you get single issue candidates who will not win, who tell you they won't win, but try to bring additional people to the process, not for the greater good, but to direct second place votes to the person they want to win. That is what has happened real time in Maine. It's not theory. It has happened real time. <clears throat> it is happening real time. Thank you for that. Jen, did you want to comment on your race, how you may have changed your campaigning if Rick Choice was in place? I mean, I think that, you know, it's the same. I, for me, it was the same message. I, I think the difference would be for me to have spoken to those Democrats that were harassing me over being a Republican, instead of telling them that it's not a partisan race and there's no um, letter next to my name saying to them, okay, you know, you have a choice to make. You could write her in first, but if you, if she, you know, why don't you think of me as your second choice and put me down as number two? Um, and, you know, we kind of knew before the preliminary, it was going to be me and her because I was the only one with an R next to my name. And so in the very beginning, it was four women and two men and one man dropped out. And so it was four women and one person of color who was the man. And so we had a really interesting race. And I think the dynamic of the race would have changed a ton if we were able to use it in the preliminary. Because back then I kept saying, because I know ranked choice voting, I'm happy being everyone's number two. I'm happy being the second choice. So I almost used ranked choice voting in my preliminary as a example, because I would say to people, I know she's gonna be, you know, she's the top, she's the top pick, because she knew everyone and she had, she was a democratic activist. And so it was, it, I knew that she was going to be the winner. And all I kept saying to people was, okay, so, you know, if you have her and she's the liberal, why would you pick another liberal? If you get to pick two people, pick someone totally different who you think is qualified. That's how I ended up coming up in the top two to begin with. And so I think, you know, if we were able to use that and, and see if that was the actual election, if my vote tally would have been higher than <clears throat> ours based on the fact that I would have been probably most other people's number two. And so I don't think that the messaging needed to change much other than we ha we did have it in the preliminary. Um, and so, and that's really all it is, is saying, okay, I might not be your first choice that you love because I don't have exactly the same politics as you, but would, would you consider me being your second choice? I just need to get in the running. Um, and so I think that's where it's really helpful is for, I mean, because if it was any other way, I would have lost and it would have been two liberal women running against each other, which I don't think is good for democracy. Jen, okay. on the uh, board that you sit on, it's Fair Vote, I believe. Yes. That's a nationwide organization. Yes. Are there plans to try to bring this to 50 states? Um, I mean, ultimately, yes, it, you know, looking at if it's good for for democracy. So I know Utah has been using it, they used it actually in their presidential primary, they used it recently in their state convention. Um, and so for and that's the Utah Republican Party, by the way, <laughs> it has been has been using this um, Alaska. And so, you know, we have been working with state parties. Um, there are other state former Republican state party leaders um, like myself that were in kind of my class when we were we were all in together that are super interested in this because they're from blue states and they know how difficult it is for Republicans to get elected. So we are talking to other um, folks in, in other areas and doing some Republican outreach, which we need everyone. This is not a partisan issue. It's a it's just a good democracy issue. Matt, I'd like to comment on something dealing with poli sci issued since you raised that question, if that's appropriate, Melissa. 
Sorry. Look, Sorry. Look, Sorry. Look, one of the things that the um, the um, um, the pro uh, rank voting folks say is that, well, listen, this is a harmless process. It's in fact a very destructive process, but it's a harmless process. It's really just an instant runoff. Well, let's think about this for a minute. An instant runoff, what they mean is you go to the ballot, you, you pick up your ballot, there were four candidates listed. You rank them one, two, three, four. And they're saying, well, <clears throat> we take the individual uh, who gets the smallest amount of votes. In my race, there were, there were four folks, as I mentioned. One, the folk, fellow that came in second got 5,000 votes. There were about 375,000 that were cast. You got about 5,000 votes. So he is eliminated from contention. However, however, um, the voters that he attracted, that voted for him first, take the votes that were cast second <laughs> and allocate those second place votes to the other three candidates, right? Mm -hmm. And if no one gets above 50%, then they do it with the person who came in third. The person who came in third in that race got 10,000 votes and they did the same thing. Now, an instant runoff when you go to the ballot means that if it goes to ranked voting, you will know who the final two candidates are. You don't know that. I mean, in that case you did because it was the Democrat and myself and these other two, but sometimes you get well-funded independent candidates. You, it is not an instant runoff because when you go and you cast multiple votes on the same ballot, you don't know who the runoff is between. You just don't know. So it's complete, it, it's just not true. Uh, now, if, if folks are really concerned about having a runoff, then have a runoff. They do that in Louisiana, they do that in other states where you have multiple candidates and the top two people or the top three or the top four you know, vote getters, then go have another runoff. But this instant runoff, because it's ranked voting, is just completely false. Now, think about this also, Matt, from a poli sci standpoint. This is really fascinating. In my race, uh, not my race, in 2018 congressional race in the second district of Maine, it's not my seat. Uh, in that race, the voters who voted for the candidates that came in third and fourth, who had no campaigns, no real message, had no chance of winning, and they publicly told you that. The people that came and voted for them first allocated their second choices to the individual who was eventually given the seat. Meaning the voters who voted for the candidates who least represented the district ended up deciding the election. That is completely un-American and completely unfair. So we think about that for a minute. What, what, what were the vote totals in, in the election? How many votes did you get and how many votes did the winner get? Um, in the, in the, on election day, I got, I don't know what the heck, well, you have to check, you can Google this, Matt. I got something like 48% of the vote and he got like 47 or 46% of the vote. I won by about a point, roughly. Then they go to this crazy, confusing ranked voting process, right? Uh, and then there were these 8,000 ballots that were eliminated. So even with the reallocation of second place votes, the guy that came in second, he never got above 50% of the total votes cast. Is this not true? Here's another thing that's really, I should be on the alert, Matt, to the folks in Massachusetts. Really important. Um, in, now, I don't know how you do it in Massachusetts. In the state of Maine, we have 494 municipalities, cities, towns, and plantations. Is 351 it, here. I'm sorry? 351 here. Okay, but you can drive from Springfield, you know, to, to, to Charleston in what, three hours or something? To drive from Kittery to Madawaska is like an eight hour drive. I can get to New York quicker. My point is, if it kicks into rank voting, instead of relying on these town clerks who say, you know, I know Matt Cheswick, Matt, come on in. Yeah, here's your ballot. Go vote, how are the kids, everything's fine at work, good. Thanks, tell your wife I said hi, okay? They know who you are. If it goes to rank voting, these ballots 
either on a thumb drive or the actual ballots must be transported from all of these towns by courier, it's supposed to be by state police. We don't have enough cops up here. If we did that with our cops, we wouldn't patrol 95 with all the people trying to break the law coming up from Massachusetts. So it, they get to use couriers. So you have all of these ballots being transported, it's secure or not, I don't know, to a safe room in Augusta where then they got to crank the numbers through ranked voting. That's number one. Second, which is even more important, Melissa, is that during this process, we asked the main secretary of state, who's part of the hard left up here, a nice fellow, very, Matt Dunlap, very much part of the hard left, is that we asked him publicly and privately, Matt, we want to inspect the algorithm. There's a black box that you push that does the computation. We said, well, we want to check this. He said, I'm sorry, Bruce, it's a trade secret from the vendor we bought the system from. Now, think of that. No transparency, cannot check it, and a computer black box spits out how this is all tabulated. Now, here's why this is important. Six months ago, excuse me, uh, four months ago, four or five months ago, during the main congressional primary, not the general election, the primary in July, so I guess it's a few months ago, three weeks, Melissa, after the rank voting was done. Matt Dunlap announces that they just found 13,000 votes. What do you mean you just found 13,000? They found 13,000 votes that were not counted in the rank voting process. Now, they then counted them and it didn't change the result in the primary election for the second district. It is so confusing, you can't check it. There's no way to verify it, at least in the state of Maine, and again, this is reality. I'm not talking about theory. I'm talking about how this works. It is incredibly confusing and it turns off seniors and uh, folks who are lower income earners who just have not studied it. We have busy lives up here. We're pulling traps, we're bailing hay, we're cutting wood. We're not, we don't study how to vote. We just go to the polls, one person gets one vote, you tally it up, the person who gets the most votes, it's over. I've been doing it for 200 years until this thing came to me. <laughs> and the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again. I mean, again, it, it goes to the fact of it, the system is a little bit broken. And if we are not all continuously trying to fix systems, then we're gonna be stuck in ruts that we can't get out of. I'm a mother of three young daughters and I want the future to be different for them. And I don't feel as though in the past 48 years of my life, the system has changed at all. I'm still a woman, I'm still, still trying to climb up that ladder. I still have a glass ceiling above me. And so as a woman in politics, I'm looking for any way for the system to change, to be more beneficial. So there's more diversity and more competition. And so, and to me, this is one of those ways. And listen, if it doesn't work, it doesn't mean that we can't go and look at a different system and that we can't change. And the hardest thing for anyone to ever do is make that slight change. It's like moving. It's like moving out of your hometown. The first time you move, you say, oh, that actually wasn't so bad. Maybe I could move again. But if you're always in the same place and you never change and you never are open to change, then the world never changes. Everything happens around you and we are not actually effectuating that change. That's what's interesting about this ballot question. No, and Jen, listen, my, my heart goes out to you and I salute you for what you're, you're, you're doing. Um, I, I just disagree with you. And my, my point is the following, is that up in Maine anyway, and I can't speak for Massachusetts, up in Maine, as Republicans, we get pounded on. So you're not alone in this. If we were in Utah or Montana or Mississippi or Alabama, it would be very different. Or Kansas, right? Or Idaho, I mean, it would be very different. But we're in the Northeast. So you're gonna get pounded on as a Republican in the Northeast. I did, you did, LePage did, Trump did. I mean, it just is what it is. But it doesn't mean you change the way you vote because people are being critical of you being a Republican. That's number one. Second of all, 
is that if you want to get more women elected, I think there are probably better ways to do it than change how we vote. And, and, and I do take exception um, in that our system isn't broken up here. It wasn't broken for 220 years. Um, and when you use one person, one vote, you get the most votes on election day, you win. Where we still use that, it works fine. So our system isn't broken up here. For example, we have had, and this might be helpful, um, Maine has had um, Jim Longley, uh, an independent governor back in the 70s. We've had Republicans and Democrats send then Angus King uh, is uh, most recently an independent governor up here, third party candidate. He's now one of our two senators, as you probably you know, likely know. So the system up here works. We didn't need ranked voting. It was not an idea that came from Maine and it was pushed upon us in a special election with very low turnout with a ton of money from the outside. And yes, fair vote activists, not the board, but folks on the ground that were hired uh, to, uh, to do this. So I, I just, you know, vote, just beware in Massachusetts. If you vote for this, it's very hard to get rid of once you've passed this in the state, once you use this, but it is an incredibly confusing process uh, that, uh, that really depresses vote. We have proven that with numbers um, to, uh, especially to, uh, to seniors. Chris, we got a yes on two uh, graphic up here. What's on the other side of the issue? Is there organized opposition? Are you talking to me? Yeah. I didn't understand the question. Um, the yes on two, there's fair vote. There's the groups that Jen work with. Is there an organization that's trying to do no on two? Oh, I see. Up here in Maine? Uh, in Massachusetts or nationwide. I, I don't know. You have to ask Jen that. Uh, well, I will tell you this, if this is helpful, Matt. I've talked to the folks in Alaska, New Hampshire, Massachusetts. You're the second, third, fourth group I've talked to in other places around the country who are still going through this. And it looks like there is more than not individual um, organizations in the state of Maine, it was the Maine Republican Party that was fighting this. There now is a national organization and I can't remember what the name of it was, Matt, but you can Google it. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, an Alaska based organization, if I'm not mistaken, but they're not nearly as well organized uh, as Fair Vote and they're not as well funded. I mean, you see what, what the funding sources are. I mean, really the funding source of the Democrat party is, is a great part, Hollywood and, and Wall Street and tech, right? I, I'm just stating a fact. It's not, that's actually, Bruce, I, I love your, your, your um, description of what happened in Maine, but I, will t I am actually a board member. I am actually, one of my roles is development. I can tell, and I'm one of two people in development on Fair Vote. We don't have any Hollywood. It's not Hollywood. We have foundations. We have the yeah. Democracy Fund. We have foundations like that that are 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 Democrat are are democracy based, not democratic. There is small D democracy based organizations and foundations that support our work. It's not it's not big Hollywood. And I would not I would not actually put myself in a position as a fiscal re conservative Republican in being on anything where we were funded by Soros or any of the Hollywood institutions. You're funded by other foundations. Who funds those foundations? I'm gonna open this up to questions. I know some, um, somebody did um, send me a question asking, um, is, do you feel that ranked choice voting favors non-incumbents? No, Anybody know. else have, and if you have a question you wanna ask, um, let me know. Um, or pop me an email and, or pop me a message in the chat right now. Are you asking me, Melissa, or? Um, I guess I'm asking both. Uh, Jen, go ahead, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I think ranked choice voting, um, it probably favors the person who's actually out campaigning the most and working the hardest. Because if you're an incumbent, you have the advantage of the incumb of the power of incumbency. So people already know your name. I think when it comes to ranked choice voting, it gives the opposition an opportunity to say, at least think of me as an alternative to the same old, same old that you've had in office. Um, my experience, Melissa, is ranked voting favors the major party candidate, Republican or Democrat, who has enlisted uh, single issue voters of the same political ideology 
to direct second place votes to him or her. That's what it's designed for. Thank you. Looks like Senator Brewer is nodding. Is there a question or a comment there? I, oh, I think he's thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you all. Uh, Bruce, first of all, offline at some point in time, I would just love to know how you campaign in that district up there by Millinocket and Fort Kent and everything else, because my Senate district was larger than the state of Rhode Island. And I was I would do probably 80,000 miles a year just doing that. But that's an offline question. Uh, the issue at hand is Massachusetts, one month away from now. And uh, Jen knows this very well. She's very well schooled in debating Jim Browdy uh, for many times. And uh, you better bring your A game when you're debating Jim Browdy. That's for Don Shaw. So you got a month away. There's confusion about ballot questions. Now, I could be held to this, but generally speaking, it's the golden rule when it comes to ballot questions. They who have the gold rule. I can only remember a tobacco excise question where the most money on one side actually lost. When voters are confused or haven't been fully educated on a matter at that moment in time, they will either just blank it, most likely they'll just blank it because people are going in this November with a pretty sincere idea on what they're doing at the top of the ballot. So, Jen, the education part about, and you know, it's got to keep it simple, got to keep it understandable, <clears throat> because it is complicated. Americans generally like, we got, as, as Bruce has said, 220 years of the winner takes all. But, you know, uh, in a four-person race, Abraham Lincoln got 39% of the vote, and he became our president of the United States prior to uh, coming on to the Civil War. So there's a lot of work on education to be done in this regard at this point in time. And nothing gets done very rapidly when it comes to the most, the, the, the most heartfelt entity that we have, and that is citizen participation in democracy. My job is to try to involve as many people as we can. However you choose to vote, go and do that. And I would make a pitch to all of you that um, early voting in your local voting precincts. Now, my town of Barry, um, I go in there, I'm the only person there besides at least five poll workers and I can feel extraordinarily safe and vote, clean up and get out of there. And people out of, instead of complication regarding postal and da da da, try to just show up at your town, your town polling place on this early vote, a very boring Saturday at 11 o'clock in the morning, show up. You might be the only person in there. Anyway, both Bruce and Jen and all of you who are uh, articulating this cause I commend you. Make sure, make sure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. Um, hearing no other questions, I just want to, on behalf of the Neshoba Valley Chamber, I want to thank you both for joining us. Um, lots of information for everybody to think, uh, think of as <clears throat> they, as they go, definitely get out and vote. Um, very special thanks to Mount Wachusett Community College for sponsoring our public policy series. And um, thank you all for joining us this morning. I, if anybody has any follow-up questions, um, if they can email us and we'll um, connect you to um, the appropriate person. Matt, did I leave anything out? Uh, no, just um, thanks to two great speakers. We're very honored and privileged to have two high profile individuals who are at the forefront of this. I don't think we get any two better people to discuss the issue and hopefully provide a little bit of clarity to everybody else out there. Um, so thank you. I appreciate you guys getting up early and coming on at eight o'clock. Um, so thank you for that. And then uh, Melissa, we're gonna uh, repurpose this for the rest of the chamber members. Yes, we are. Email it out or post it up on the website so um, we can get a little more traction and uh, a little more uh, views on this. I think it'd be important for democracy. <laughs>